all of our material is giving out, giving to, giving to students schools for free. I said we're in over 600 across the country so far and growing, and uh, we're looking forward to, to expanding that. So again, not only sharing the inspiration and the role models, but actual financial literacy advice. Um, well, the yeah. financial literacy, if I had a magic wand, I'd make that the number one, number one educational program in every school in the country. I, it'd be, it would be second only after reading. Yes. <laughs> you well, have to read to know, do something about numbers and finances, but that's, that would be my mandate that, that you, you, you know, once you can read, the next thing you do, particularly if you live in a capitalist country like we are, the next thing you do, you better start knowing about finances. Well, that's that's right. And I think uh, one of the things that the ambassador sort of said, that was a really important component to what we were trying to do. But I, I'm going to get to that in a little bit. But I got to ask you, since you just brought it up, why do you think, sir, that what you just talked about being in every school, why isn't it? That's a that's a tough question. I mean, I, I, the simple answer would be that the people who control the school don't see the value in it the way they see in, in other uh, subject matters. Uh, that's sort of the simple answer, but as to why they, the people in power who decide what is in our educational system don't focus on that. I, I, I think it has to do with the belief that uh, individuals have the sole responsibility for their financial well-being. And it's not something that the government should advocate because if the government would do it, it would call into question the nature of our economic system. Because once you say this is what you should know about financing and wealth, you start asking why is wealth regulated like this? Why are there rich people and why are there poor people? Why is there a wealth gap? Should there be a universal wealth system? Should there be a universal income? It's, it begins to raise the question of why capitalism was created. It was created based on the individual's ability to create their own wealth. And then we moved into a regulated capitalistic system as opposed to just a free open market system where if you got more money, you had more power. We keep keeping in my mind, remember back in the days that if you weren't a landowner, you couldn't vote. That's right. So I think it just would raise in people's minds what is the economic system under which this country operates is in the best interest of the masses. And I think people don't want to go down that road. And then would you then also say then that by going down that road, then you open up the door to talking about race in America? Well, you open up to talk to, you open up the door to talk about human rights. And I guess you you can put race on that, but it wouldn't have to be race. You just put it. You can start talking about caste systems. You can talk about uh, wealth ownership. You can talk about a wealth gap. So once you start talking about what economic model you want your society to exist under, uh, then everything becomes uh, discussion. You know, uh, and that I think is 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 or is because if this were a communist system, the all the government government dictates you got to read, but they tell you what to read. You know, so <laughs> that's here. You know, so if we start talking about wealth, the next question is, what rights do all Americans have to wealth? And that's not a capitalist system. A capitalist system bases wealth on your individual ability, uh, theor theoretically your individual ability and merit to obtain wealth. And it becomes a, a government based on economic meritocracy. Well, no, I, I appreciate something yeah, I appreciate. that you have to 
people, I think the reason you don't make that a primary thing in school is because you'd have to get into, it, it would be a slippery slope, no, I didn't mean a slippery slope, a fast slope into a broader question of who should control wealth. Fascinating. You know, th thank you for that, Mr. Johnson. And uh, I'd like to get back to that. But one of the things that always fascinates me, sir, is, you know, there are a lot of people are very familiar with your tremendous success. And people are I'm always interested in people when people are growing up, their role models, their heroes, um, the people that inspired them and, and believed in them. Can we talk a little bit about, about your growing up, sir, and, and, and people that fall into that category? Uh, well, my growing up was, uh, I would say, pretty, you know, common in a way, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I was nine, number nine of 10 children. My family, my parents were working class people. My mother, I grew up in Mississippi, was born in Mississippi. Uh, my mother was uh, uh, at that time down there, a, a school teacher in one of those one room schoolhouse type uh, schools. And my father worked in uh, what you call the timber business, basically chopping down trees and hauling trees to be, you know, turned into uh, either paper or furniture, or whatever uh, the, the market called for. And uh, when I was about four years old, uh, my family, all 10 of us, moved to a small town outside of, uh, uh, in, in Illinois, outside of, uh, about 100 miles outside of Chicago, called Freeport, Illinois. And uh, again, my parents went to work in, in factories in the town. And uh, I grew up uh, with uh, my nine brothers and sisters. Um, whatever you call it, luck, uh, whether you call it the grace of God or whether you call it the, the selection in the gene pool, I ended up being the first uh, of my family to go on to college. Um, I graduated successfully from high school with pretty high grades. Uh, again, I contributed that to the gene pool. Uh, and from there, went to undergrad at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, and from there to the, um, uh, at that time it was called the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University and graduated from Princeton. Yeah. And uh, it was uh, a family life, like I said, of, of, of parents and children who each sort of sought their own, you know, interests. Um, uh, and I just happened to be the one that sort of uh, ex excelled in uh, the education system of uh, high school, college, and, and a master's degree in, at, at Princeton University. Well, th thank you for sharing that, Mr. Johnson. And I'm curious, were there, in terms of your parents or any other relatives or people going up through high school, uh, who sort of again were your role models, sir? Who sort of really stepped in and, and really believed in you? And, you know, and what, what did you what did you learn the most from your parents, sir? Well, I, I think uh, my parents were always, as I said earlier, were always working class people, and I don't mean working class people by defining a character. Or they, I mean it by behavior. They always went to work. They, they, you know, you got ten kids to support. You got to go to work. So they were people who believed in, you know, a certain amount of morality, don't do anything wrong, a certain amount of, uh, of I'd say, uh, behavior. Uh, if you're going to work, work hard, do the best you can. Uh, and if you're going to learn the same thing, learn everything you can and, and become good at uh, education. Uh, educational learning, uh, because that they believed that uh, that was your path to the future. And this was com something common to just about every uh, Black family that migrated from the South to the North, uh, particularly during World War II. Yes. You know, a lot of Black people sought jobs in the factories, the war factories, and, and um, during that time, and the kids stayed up in the North. And so it was a, a sense of, uh, you know, character. You had to have a good character. You didn't 
do anything wrong. Uh, of course, the uh, and my parents, both particularly on my mother's side, the the church played a big role. So we went to Sunday school and you know Baptist uh, B, what they call BTU Baptist training, and it, it was the idea that you should you know show good character, uh, be kind and nice to people and respectful of people and do the best you can to be the best you you can, whatever it is. And that was sort of the cornerstone of of what I grew up with as a young uh, boy and a man. So I'm curious with, with your parents coming from Mississippi, from the South, coming up North, what were the lessons that your parents tried to impart on you in terms of being black in America? The lessons of, of race, sir. You know, we um, it's a, it's it's interesting that uh, when uh, I moved with my parents to Freeport, Illinois, when I was about three or four years old, went to grammar school, kindergarten, in fact, well, grammar school, I guess it was. Uh, the 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 house that we lived in and the family. Uh, we lived on in a town of about 30,000 people, excuse me, 30,000 people, and about 10% of that town was black. Uh, uh, the blacks lived in one side of town. Most of the whites lived on the other side of town, separated by a, a river and a racetrack, a, ra a railroad track. Um, and we tended to be sort of accepting of our place. Uh, I don't recall much in the way of racial, uh, you know, uh, agitation or racial protest in the town. Uh, we all had put to school. Most of the teachers were white. Most of the police officers in the town were white. Most of the doctors we went to were white. So it was pretty much accepted that the, the the town of Freeport, Illinois, was a town where race was not really talked about. As long as you accepted that, uh, if you're black and you went to work, you were treated well at work, and you got paid. You spent your money at white-owned businesses and grocery stores, and bought your cars at white-owned dealerships, and you know, uh, blacks were pretty much. Uh, in a uh, comfortable place, I would say. So uh, it was, and so therefore, at home, there wasn't a lot of talk about racism as a, something to be worried about or concerned about. And part of that could have been, I think, probably was attributed to that my mother uh, was heavily involved in the church. And the black church for a very long time, particularly certain parts of the North, the Union Baptist Church, tended to believe that you know, the church and the church's teachings would protect you from anything that was uh, negative to you if you believed and, and behaved right and, and acted as the Bible teaches you, you know, be good to one another, you know, turn the cheek if someone offends you, you know, that that kind of ideology. And the town was, was sort of, uh, I'd say, socialized around the Baptist church and socialized around the notion that, uh, keep in mind, Freeport, uh, I mean, Illinois was the land of Lincoln. So it was supposedly a place where uh, Black people could find, you know, a certain level of acceptance and a proper treatment. So no need to think you're going to get beat up by a police officer or, you know, or denied fundamental yes. rights. So I'm, I'm curious, Mr. Johnson, and then do you, when you went off to university and then later on you get your master's in Princeton, were those same, that same, I would call it comfort zone or that same, pattern that was going on in your hometown did that continue to exist sir no i mean when if you recall so if you figure that uh at, at 
my age of going to the University of Illinois, let's say it's uh, 1964, 1964, the, the, the racial movement is just beginning to wake up in the north i mean of course it was down the south it was obvious but in the north it was just beginning to wake up and i was moving away from a very secluded if you will or sequestered town of three thousand black people where everybody knew each other to a university at sixty thousand people with about you know, maybe 10 percent black students so we were getting students from, it was an state school. So we're getting most students were coming from Illinois. And so you're getting a little bit of bad behavior. So it was not an activist kind of uh, school environment. Uh, it was still pretty much uh, a Northern school where again, most of the teachers were white. Uh, the whole administration was white. And the students came from parents uh, in the North of Illinois. And Chicago and Peoria, towns like that, where it was, they were pretty much, much like Freeport, maybe a little bit bigger. Obviously, Chicago was much bigger, but you still had that same kind of behavior. I do remember just, you know, I would say not, not something that was on the minds of the 600 students that pledged the fraternity. And so when you play the fraternity, you pretty much find your own sort of friends and your own know, sort of society of how you operate. And 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 so I don't recall any big demonstrations. I do recall black some black students, as you find, uh, wanting to be activists and say black people should come together to protest this or that. But the protests were against something that was far away. It wasn't in Champaign, Urbana. I mean, there might have been a couple of shootings in the town outside of the campus that would get people talking about somebody got shot by the police or beat up by the police or yes. attacked. But it was not something that 64 to 68 uh, at Illinois was a hotbed of activism like this, the, the black colleges in the South. Well, I'm curious, sir, then, we're talking about that particular time uh, the the assassination of the Kennedys, Malcolm X, Dr. King, did that have what effect, if any, did that have on you, sir? Well, for me, I mean, the uh, the idea of the riots in Chicago during the '68 uh, um, camp convention in Chicago and uh, the riots in Detroit. Uh, were, I would say, global, if you will, things in every community. Uh, people talked about them. Some people became activists and went out and marched or handed out leaflets or uh, became more visible in the way they dressed. It was also the Black Panther uh, movement, uh, the Fred Hampton murder and and, and that, and of course, we had you know speakers, uh, you know, from the Panther movement uh, to speak on campus. Uh, but for me, I was more of a carrying with me to Illinois, sort of a, a discipline that I sort of brought with me from Freeport. It was, you know, I, I wanted to focus on education. I wanted to, you know, be successful in pursuing whatever I wanted to do. I was a deep student of history. So with history as my background, uh, both in, in high school and then became a, and then as a social studies teacher at a uh, degree at Illinois, uh, I was more philosophical about uh, changes and events from a historical standpoint not from an emotional standpoint. So I never became even, you know, minor in a minor way, active in protests and marches and and carrying signs. And I always looked at it as uh, these are things that 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 are happening. Uh, you got to figure out how you're going to address them individually, not as a group or as a race. 
And so my behavior was one of being pretty much inward thinking about how these things are going to affect my life as opposed to outward thinking. And I, and I think part of that was because I figured that if there were changes were going to come about, I would do those changes from my own initiative, not with a group. Interesting. Again, uh, again, thank you, sir. So I, I'm curious. You're you're at the university. You're you're getting a teacher's degree, and then you end up going to Princeton, the Woodrow Wilson School. There, there must have been some interest in the Foreign Service. How did that sort of transition, sir? Well, the, the interest was that uh, I did have an interest in foreign affairs and international affairs. I would call it probably more rightly. Because if you recall, when uh, history was taught in the high schools, history was taught on the basis principally not so much of political changes, but really on dates and names. So if you could name when did World War I start, who were all the allies, who were the allies, who were the Axis, what caused the launch of World War I, uh, when you go back further back to 19th century history and you remember German unification of Germany, unification of, of Italy, uh, the war between France and England and all of that, you learn dates and events. And so it, it became uh, what you call global power politics that you learn. So that led me to be more focused on international affairs or foreign affairs or uh, or the role of, of governments in big political changes. Some of them were economic, but most of them were built around wars. You know, Europe went from a war between Britain and France almost, you know, every 10 years. And then you had wars, unification wars in Germany and unification wars in Italy and and conquest of, uh, you know, uh, uh, territories outside of your, all of that was based on names and dates. And if you can name, give names and dates, you got good grades in history, uh, uh, history classes. So I graduated with honors from Illinois, I mean, from high school in uh, history and then same thing in, in Illinois, because I understood what, in some ways, what professors were looking for. And uh, that was sort of my ability to uh, use what I've always had is a uh, something called an eidetic memory, which is ability to just recall dates, places, and events. And uh, so that's how I came into foreign service. And then when I graduated from Illinois, uh, there was a program uh, put on by the Ford Foundation to attract uh, black students or uh, black graduates to go to the foreign, to go into the U.S. Foreign Service, and I applied for the program and was accepted. And if you succeeded in completing that program that was sponsored by the Ford Foundation, the the uh, Ford Foundation would pay your way to whatever international affairs graduate school, international affairs graduate school would accept you. And one of the schools I applied to are several schools and uh, to Princeton, to the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins, uh, to school in Denver and another one, uh, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. And uh, I was accepted at Princeton and the Ford Foundation paid my tuition to go to Princeton along with the university. That's, that's fantastic. And so at that point, because I think I had uh, heard somewhere that, you know, at some point you were sort of, the idea of becoming an ambassador was sort of very intriguing to you. Yeah, I mean, because once you go to, you go to Princeton and you go to the Woodrow Wilson School, it's it's all focused on international affairs and politics. And you get uh, tutorials and teaching from people who formerly were foreign services or who wrote books based on U.S. foreign foreign policy. So yeah, that was that became my primary interest of uh, one day serving as an ambassador uh, at some point, and uh, because I was steeped in 
in global history and power politics and geography of power politics. So yeah, that was that was, to me was an easy step. So then you go on to DC and what happens there? Because I know you became a lobbyist for the cable companies. What um, what made you decide to go that particular route, sir? Well, that's where I think if, if, if people look back on their lives and why things happen, and I, I always said you got to throw in serendipity and the grace of God. It's just luck or you something else happened that puts you in the right place. And for me... It just happened. I happened to be at a neighbor's party and there was a person there who worked in the cable television industry. And, uh, and of course, with conversations, we were talking, she said, hey, you'd make a great lobbyist for the cable television industry. And I said, I didn't know anything about cable television. She said, don't worry, I didn't know anything about either, but I'll <laughs> introduce you to the head of the trade association. And I met the gentleman head of the trade association, and uh, um, he uh, offered me a job to lobby for the deregulation of cable television. Cable television was an infant industry, uh, principally in the mountains and hills, uh, because it provided a way of transmitting TV signals when they were blocked by mountains or, or I think, uh, trees and forests because the signal wouldn't go then and you'd have to run a cable down from a mountain or hill to, into the town. So it was, it was more of a, a small industry trying to compete with broadcasting, over the air broadcasting. And so my job was to lobby for the deregulation of cable to allow it to compete and principally deregulate cable at that time simply meant uh, insisting, passing legislation to require telephone companies to put cable telephone te cable uh, wires on telephone poles. Mm -hmm. They normally wouldn't do it unless you paid them an exorbitant amount and they were not mandated. Well they were they all, they had they had the only the telephone companies had the complete right away to do it. And no one could just walk out and start stringing wires on a telephone pole. And so that was part of the job. And then later on it cable became an industry when the technology of satellite distribution allowed for a, a cable signal to be beamed from a satellite circulating the uh, equator to any place on the globe. And that led uh, cable television to become a communications technology and a content distribution technology that uh, allowed everybody to get it once it was deregulated. And so I was sort of uh, uh, fortuitous in being in the industry at the right time of a technological shift and an economic shift in uh, uh, access to content. So then you, 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 you go from being a lobbyist then to being an entrepreneur starting BET. And again, what was your, in retrospect, sir, what was sort of the, you talk about being fortuitous, but uh, you must have obviously had some serious insight um, and probably some trepidation as well about moving forward with this. How, how did that sort of work, sir? Well, I, I think it goes back. It is, I get this question all the time, what makes an entrepreneur? And uh, it, there's no real answer. It's just something that's inside you. First, you have to have a work ethic. You got to believe in yourself that you know, working means something to you. And I've always... Again, back to Freeport, Illinois, I always grew up having a summer job working. I didn't hesitate to work. Uh, I didn't hesitate to, uh, to, to do what I call uh, manual labor even. So I was comfortable as long as I was sort of, in, you know, doing it for myself and believed in it and uh, felt that I could, you know, benefit from it. Uh, and so basically, I always believed in, uh, you know, doing things for myself and never was really a, a big believer in sort of working for uh, somebody else. Uh, I always uh, I remember when uh, I was growing up uh, and for some reason I decided to get a uh, paper route, which is a natural thing that, you know, young boys do. I guess girls can do it, too. But boy. 
And the paper happened to be a morning paper called the Rockford Morning Star, which meant that you had to deliver the paper in the morning. I didn't like getting up in the morning, so I never would deliver the paper on time or at all. And my mother, being a responsible woman, didn't want her child being leaving no, no papers at her neighbor's door. So she told me, look, here's what I'm going to do. I'll let you, I'll make you, I guess she said, make, I'll ask your brother to deliver the morning paper. You do the collection in the afternoon and you pay him. So I said, okay, I'll do that. So I sort of started feeling that, you know, I could had to control my own business destiny by not doing something I didn't want to do. So when I um, got into the cable industry and on the trade association, most of the people in the, almost all of the trade associations were business entrepreneurs and cable was an entrepreneurial business at that time. Uh, it was not made of Fortune 500 companies. It was made of, of, of people who were, you know, some of them just hanging wires on, on telephone poles and others trying to come up with programs that they could put on it, uh, on the cable system. And so I have had to be in the fortunate place. And that's why I say it's fortuitous. Happened to be in a place where I'm meeting other, meeting true entrepreneurs, almost all of them white, who had a vision about what the cable television industry could become. And I, at the time, again, this is where this entrepreneurial inspiration comes from. I don't know. But I recognize that cable, in order for it to grow and become a truly scalable uh, a content and, just, and entertainment enterprise, had to be in the big cities. It couldn't survive just being in the rural uh, towns and the mountain hill, hills and mountains. It had to be in the big cities. And I realized that at that, that time, uh, that the way cable uh, companies got access to string wires in the cities and to operate in cities, uh, they had to get a franchise from the government, from the city council. Well, by that time, this is now the early uh, 70s, um, most, a lot of big cities, not a lot of, a few big cities had black mayors or at least several members on the city council who were going to decide who got a cable franchise. And it, it just occurred to me that these franchises would have to offer black programming. And there was no black programming on the cable systems. Uh, we're all the white co content programming, providing program. And uh, again, being a student of history and reader, I sort of followed Ebony Magazine and its history from being a, a magazine that covered the rise of the black middle class and became the, the black magazine, uh, Reverend Ebony and Jet. And then black radio, it was a primary source of black music content and black enterprise uh, business content. So I said, gee, somebody is going to start a black cable channel. Why not me? And it was the why not me part that I think is what makes a uh, entrepreneur different from most people. There's a belief that you have a vision that can see you over the next hill that you could conceive of something that the average person or even the above average person can't conceive or would want to do. And so I basically said, there's a black magazine that chronicles the black middle class that black people read. There are black radio stations they listen to. Why wouldn't they watch black programming on cable if you could get the program to put over the cable system and get it to the household? So that led me to the creation of uh, Black Entertainment Television, BET. The technology was right because of the ability of satellites to deliver the signal into big cities. The, the regulatory environment was right since the government decided that cable should be allowed to compete against over-the-air television, broadcast TV, and local TV. And... The industry was made up of entrepreneurs who may be willing to give someone who thought like they did a helping hand. And that's how I had a chance to meet a guy named John Malone, yes. who was a large cable owner and who uh, one day told me, Bob, if you have an idea, come out to Denver and talk to me. I'll be glad to hear what you got to say. And so you put 
those factors together, that put me in the, on the path to uh, launching Black Entertainment Television. Why well, I, I had seen a wonderful story about what you just talked about with Mr. Malone and that um, <clears throat> when you asked him to invest and you, I think it was a half a million dollars, you got the money from him. And once you had the money sort of in your hand, you, you said something very fascinating to him, which is something to the effect of, um, now that I have the money, could you give me some some advice on how to run a business? Uh, is that true? That that was fantastic. Uh, that's that's absolutely true. The way it started, it's it's pretty simple. Again, John Malone was an was an entrepreneur himself uh, and a believer in meritocracy. I mean, if he, if he didn't care whether you're black, white, or green, as long as you show a commitment to do the best that you can be with whatever you have, he was going to support you. And so when he asked me how much it would take to start Black Entertainment Television, I told him $500,000. And this uh, conversation took all of about 30 minutes. He said, well, Bob, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to invest $180,000 for 20% of your business, and I'm going to loan you three twenty. dollars so 18320 is $500,000 and he said under that scenario Bob you're going to be the 80% owner and I'll be the 20% owner he said is that a deal and I thought about it and I said John that's a deal what Malone didn't know at the time if he'd reversed the numbers and said I'll be 80 and Bob you'll be 20 is that a deal I would have said John that's a deal so <laughs> Uh, and he didn't say that. So it takes about 30 minutes. To, he brings me a one sheet contract or really an agreement with a contract because uh, we didn't have lawyers involved. And he gave it to me and he said, uh, Bob, here's a check, wrote out a check to me for $500,000. I like to say $500,000 was probably equal to the total GDP of every black person in Freeport. But, you know, I, I had it. And so I said, uh, John, I got some advice. He said, what? He said, now that you know, so by that time I had the check in my hand, of course. Uh, he said, I, I said, I've never run a business. What advice can you give me? And he said, Bob, it's very simple. Get your revenues up and keep your costs down. And that was my Harvard MBA uh, thesis on how to run a business. Revenues up, cost down, which I keep to me this day. Yeah. And so that was how I how BET got its start with that five hundred thousand dollar check. And when I look back on it, is I think that one of the things that I think is most needed in this country, which doesn't exist is that there needs to be more people like John Malone to help young black entrepreneurs and visionaries who have ideas, but lack not only capital, which he gave me obviously, but great advice and guidance. John Malone stayed on the board for BET for 20 years until we sold it and uh, never sold a share of the stock and made a lot of money when we sold the company. Uh, that's that's a great story, sir. So I'm curious, and I you know I don't want to, I know there are probably tons of stories you could tell here, but when you look back on it, the one or two sort of pivotal moves you made that turned the company into success, and maybe one or two of the uh, moves that maybe in retrospect you regret making, sir. Can you just sort of briefly touch on that? Well, the moves that made a success, it was in the right place at the right time. There's no other way to say it. BET could not have existed without the technology that came from the launch of uh, stationary satellites uh, circling the globe, allowing a signal to be transmitted up and then signals transmitted down, giving making cable programming available across the whole country, if not the whole globe, ultimately. So that's something that I had nothing to do that that was RCA and some of the other uh, technology tech companies at that time. Uh, uh, so that 
And then, of course, I think, obviously, without John Malone, not only being the investor, the founding investor, but also leveraging his clout in the cable industry to encourage other cable companies to allow BET to get to scale. Uh, he, he did just say, here, okay, fine, I'll put you on my systems, goodbye. No, if I needed him to talk to other large cable operators to say, why are you doing business with this black guy? He would be there to support me and say what my vision was and what my ability was to execute on it. So those are the two things that really made the difference. Uh, on the uh, on the negative side, I, in a, as a entrepreneur, you very seldom look back and say what you did uh, could have been done better to uh, make you, you know, make you what? You could have made more money because that's what the end game would have been. You could have said, I could have produced a better program, but that's not, uh, you know, something that to me is meaningful to say that's a failure. You know, I didn't do these kind of programs. Uh, their strategic decisions you you pursued, they didn't come about, but they weren't totally your fault. Uh, I tried to merge with a Black-owned radio and cable company that was owned by another Black woman. It, it was successful. I tried to do a deal with John Johnson in the magazine space. Uh, he didn't want to do it. Uh, and, and so there are things like that uh, I, I don't know what you could do. Like, well, put this way. I don't know what I would point to and say, gee, if I had done that, instead of being the first black billionaire, I would have been the first black double billionaire. I mean, that's not going to, you know, make you better. Or if I'd said, if I'd, maybe if I'd put on, instead of, you know, doing music videos, put on educational programs, it would have helped more black Americans. Uh, it, you know, it, it it could have, but that was not the char. That was not the charter of the company. That's not why John Malone invested with me. Uh, he invested me to create a business in the cable industry focused on entertainment and something that would be valuable for him mm -hmm. as a partner. So uh, you you got to look at it. At least I have to. I I have to look at it from what was my purpose from day one and my purpose really was i owe an obligation to john malone to make his trust in me to create a successful business happen that was my primary driver and then second to that was to make the people who work there benefit from the benefit that as i did and so I was very proud that BET, when it went public and then was sold, created more black multimillionaires than any company that's ever existed. Because the people who work with me started with me on the ground floor. And as the company went from being launched to going public and then going private and then being sold, their economic value went up as the value of the company went up. Yes. And that was because I decided that each of them should have ownership shares in the company as I did. And if we were successful, they would benefit. If we failed, they would be in the same condition that I was in. Well, I'm curious, do you, in terms of fear, the fear of failure. Does that exist for you, sir? No, I mean, because I, I don't think the fear of failure really exists in any entrepreneurs uh, at all. I think they they don't look like they're competing against somebody. They may be focused on trying to make something happen to the best of their ability. But that's that's not a fear. It's more of a, I'd use the word disappointment, that it didn't quite work the way they hoped it would work. But I wouldn't put that under a, a, a word of a fear. fear. I think probably some people probably misguide fear with fear of, of, of success, probably 
pay them uh, that not a failure, but not sort of reaching whatever they thought they could reach. But I never had that idea of a fear of failure. I've had a fear of competition. And if you can argue that competition could cause you to fail, I mean, it might be the same thing, but it was fear of, can I compete with somebody if I don't have all the pieces together? But that's that's a natural behavior that everybody has, whether you're a football player, basketball player, or a tennis player. So sort of a two-part question. In terms of advice to young people about becoming an entrepreneur, the steps they should follow. I know you said it's it's a varied path, but I'm curious what when Bob Johnson looks back on the Bob Johnson of his teens and 20s, what advice might you give yourself? The, the gems that you've learned up to this day that you would like to impart on, an, on a younger version of you? Yeah, well, I get I get this question all the time, and I and and uh, it's uh, and I I've, I've I've been sort of trying to ask myself where does that uh, that question come from in terms of asking what would you advise of people mainly because it's a difficult to answer because I I don't know what's in the person's makeup what's in their heart what's their purpose goal objective. And if it's in being a business person or an entrepreneur, if somebody told me, I want to do this, the first question, I want to be this, the first question I'd ask is why? Then if they say why, then I could probably give them some advice, but, or why or what? But uh, it, look, it, everything that I've done starts with a belief in myself and whether or not that belief in myself should lead me to do things that benefit, you know, what makes me who I am. And so I would say to any young person, man or woman, if you want to know what to do in life, first, just believe in you, start believing in yourself. Saying, you know, asking yourself, what makes you get up in the morning? What makes you think about what you want to be the next day, the next year, the next 10 years? What makes you feel like you have a responsibility or an obligation to do something that benefits more than yourself? It could be as narrow as your brothers and sisters or as narrow as your local community or organization. But you got to sort of be your own uh, interrogator. And if you can do that, somewhere in there, you're going to find something that will drive you towards whatever that goal is. Uh, And that's what I would say. So start with that belief in yourself and then start asking yourself what I want to do, which... It leads me to talk uh, to say something that I always, whenever I have these kind of interviews, take a chance to get to because, you know, probably the most important thing. If ever if you ask ninety percent of the people the most important thing I've ever done, they would say, "Oh, he's the guy who founded BET." But in the last ten years, uh, I've done something that if you were if you were asking me today, what is the most important thing you've ever done? I would tell you it's a business that I have created with partners, of course, uh, called 401k Auto Portability. What it is, is I was able to secure the financial and strategic support of five of the largest asset management companies who manage 401k accounts so that, you know, when you get a job, most companies have a 401k where they put money in, you put money in. And then that money goes into investments and you can take it out without penalty when you retire. And I've been able to convince and bring with me uh, for the largest companies with trillions of dollars of what they call uh, assets under management. 
And the fundamental purpose of this uh, consortium of companies that I put together uh, to manage 401k accounts, the sole purpose of that company uh, is to reduce Black Americans from cashing out of their 401k retirement accounts and having no money whatsoever for retirement savings. And it's a complex technology, but it's a simple process that these companies manage over 60 to 70 percent of all the 401k accounts of corporations in this country. But heretofore, when you leave a job, A, let's say you work for Home Depot and you leave that to go work at Lowe's, these companies' technology would not teach, would not talk to each other from a standpoint of technology. So you wouldn't know where your 401k would go. Or the companies not wanting to be involved in tracking your 401k would ask you when you are transferring for a job, quitting or leaving. They would ask you, particularly people with low wage work, low wage 401k accounts, which is mostly black people and low wage workers, that we can cash you out and you can take your 401k money and go. Well, two, three things happen when you do that. One, you lose this long-term savings. We were talking about financial literacy. You lose the saving. Two, you pay taxes on when you cash out. And three, the government penalizes you because they want to keep it in there for your retirement. Well, what we've been successful in doing by combining this consortium of Fidelity, Vanguard, and Power, Principal, TIA, and alike into one committed consortium is we believe when this program is fully uh, implemented as it starts in Oct October this year, it will put over a generation or keep over a generation $619 billion into the retirement accounts of Black Americans. That to me is what I call asking yourself what do you want to do with whatever uh, vision or entrepreneurial skill or assets you have? Find something that you want to do. It doesn't have to be this. Yes. It just has to be something. And to me, when I think of what Black businesses have done and what Black businesses can do, to me, if, if, if Black businesses were to look at themselves, white businesses as well, for that matter, and say, what can I do that would change the economic, social welfare of 40 plus, 50 plus million Black Americans? It doesn't have to be all, all of them. Just say enough of them that I can do this using my economic uh, skills, instinct, and uh, vision. That to me is, is what I think is... Uh, you know, if I, somebody had a choice, you would be one of the founder of BET, but you would found, be, be the guy who put $619 billion into retirement accounts in Black America. I choose that one in a heartbeat. Yeah. No, that, that's that's very powerful. And, I, and I'm, I'm going to leave you on this note then. And I think I know the answer, but why do you think so many Black families end up cashing out, sir? Well, first of all, is you have to go with the reality. The reality is Black Americans are not sufficiently fin financially sufficient to have accumulated savings. That's one. And that's due to partly racial discrimination and being at the lower rung of economic uh, wealth creation. You know, no, no, no lack of high paying jobs lack of long jobs at the higher level of the income food chain and uh, lack of education about savings and investment. So you put those three things together and that's, you can con contribute that to a legacy of racial discrimination in terms of what we were brought here to do. We weren't brought here to be rich. We were brought here to work for free. So uh, when you look at that, and so to the point, 
when a black person is a job and they don't understand the, e the economic viability of a 401k savings account, they will look at it as discretionary income. I want to go to homecoming. I want to buy some expensive shoes. I want to buy, you know, this. Or that's one of what I call just sort of uh, using money for your own personal discretionary risk. Or I've got needs. The roof leaked. The refrigerator went out. And I got to fix the refrigerator. I got to fix the leak. And it cost me $3,000. Where can I get it? I can't borrow from a bank. I don't have the credit availability. My job won't pay for it. I got a family of three or four I got to take care of. What do you do? You change job or you move around? And then the guy says, I can give you $3,000 your 401k account. You take it. And what we've been able to do is to create a, a system where we can, using what you call a negative option, say to them, you have choices. You can put it into a 401k account and keep it, or we'll put it in there for you. And from that point on, we will always track where your 401k would be. I don't care how many times you change jobs. Typical black, typical American worker, black or white, change jobs 10 times during their work life. So we figure you work, you know, 50, 40 years, you're going to have five jobs. Uh, you have 10 jobs. And uh, what happens is, People who don't know that their savings will be there when they end up retiring tend to look at it as like, I need the money now, as opposed to thinking I've saved the money and in you know 40, 50 years, instead of having you know $5,000, I've got close to $100,000 from the uh, accumulation of, of savings and the, uh, the accounting system that just appreciates each time you have uh, and a savings. Uh, so that's where I think we need to focus on how do we get people back to the first question you asked. If you start financial literacy in the public schools at, you know, grammar school, first year grammar school on up, it would radically change the economic lifestyle of Black America. No, no, thank you for that. And I, I would, uh, I'd love to learn more about this and uh, talk to you about figuring out maybe there's a way to incorporate, you know, some of these ph phenomenal things that you're doing with uh, showing young people the benefits of, again, learning financial literacy and then waiting, uh, you know, to retirement to really benefit from these 401ks. So I would love to learn more about that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This is The Black Experience for all. If you like what you hear at The Black Experience, please consider clicking on the join button to support our nonprofit. I'm Adam P. Kennedy. Thank you for joining us.